the American dollar, the world's most commonly used instrument of exchange. Whoever decides how many of these dollars are in circulation and how much it costs to borrow some is a very powerful institution. It's known as the Federal Reserve, or Fed, and for almost two decades, one man stood at the top of it. Alan Greenspan, sir! Por un lado, hay muchos que lo identifican como un gurú económico, un maestro. Para otro, Greenspan es precisamente una de esas personas que reflejan el movimiento neoliberal, una fe ciega en el libre mercado, en la desregulación. And he was sort of the perfect messenger when the economy was booming, and it felt wonderful to think that greed was actually a moral thing. How did we get Greenspan? who was so wrong about so many things and yet remains adored by the people of money and maybe by a lot of other people who should know better. The kind of person that reminds me of an advertisement, what a rational person would do in talking to another person, trying to evaluate something would be to look at its pros and cons. Advertising is the negation of that. All you do is tell someone as if it were all that was to be said about it are the good things. That's what Mr. Greenspan did, which is why he fell so badly when it proved to be wildly off the mark what he had been saying. Unlike many of his colleagues, Alan Greenspan wasn't born into the world of high finance, though he was born on the same island. About 200 city blocks uptown of Wall Street is the neighborhood of Washington Heights. For more than a century, this community on Manhattan's northernmost tip has been a landing point for poor immigrants arriving to the U.S. At the turn of the 20th century, it was the Irish. After World War II, the Greeks. Today, it is the center of the Dominican community. But during the Depression, Greenspan's formative years, it was European Jews that called it home. Justin Martin, a former writer for Fortune magazine, is the author of what is arguably the most complete biography on Greenspan. He, he certainly benefited from the sort of the, the immigrant so strivers energy that people who are there from, there is immigrants from, from the old country who are striving to, to make it in America. He was certainly the beneficiary of that energy. He also certainly um, experienced the diversity of a neighborhood like that and various ideas bumping up against one another and that, that was sort of the, the crucible in which Greenspan was formed. This is the building where Rose, a single mother, raised her only son, Alan. Greenspan attended this elementary school, where he regularly hid out in the library reading biographies of the giant tycoons of the era, especially J.P. Morgan. He used to spend his weekends looking for coins in the sand of the nearest beach. Under my constitutional duty. In 1933, President Franklin Roosevelt signed into law Glass-Steagall, a bill to separate Wall Street high finance and regular commercial banking, in hopes of avoiding another depression like the one that the Greenspan family was struggling through. Allen, only seven years old at the time, would go on to lead the campaign to repeal Glass-Steagall. After elementary, Greenspan attended George Washington High School. Two grades ahead of him was a boy with a strong German accent whose family had narrowly escaped the Holocaust, future Secretary of State Henry Kissinger. While they weren't friends in high school, Greenspan and Kissinger shared a common future of political power, fame, fortune, and eventually, disgrace. The most financially successful members of the Greenspan family were entertainers, so Allen followed in their footsteps. He studied clarinet and saxophone at the prestigious Juilliard Academy. After a few years touring with Henry Jerome's jazz band, Greenspan turned to his other love, money, studying economics at New York University. Mr. Greenspan is a product of the American society of his time, of the American university and the economics profession grounded in that university. So for example, he cannot conceive of any economic system other than capitalism. For him, 
the notion of goods and services being produced, when he thinks about that, he thinks as though the only way to do that is to have a corporation with major shareholders who elect the board of directors, who hire the mass of workers. The mass of workers come nine to five, Monday to Friday, do the work, and then go home. The, the company, the board of directors, then decides what to produce, how to produce, where to produce, what to do with the profits. It's as if this extremely undemocratic arrangement in which a tiny group of people at the top make decisions impacting a mass of workers but exclude those workers from any participation. But for Sorry. him, it's not only democratic, but it is natural. It is the only way. There is no alternative if you want to have economic growth and higher standards of living in a democratic society to have competitive markets. And indeed, to say to him, gee, what, what would it be in our economy if we had large numbers of cooperatives where workers are their own bosses? And he, he would look at you as if you had suggested that he discuss the dark side of the moon. Like all apologists for the status quo, of a hundred years ago, a thousand years ago, or ten thousand years ago. He really imagines history has stopped with him. And nothing is so certain as the obsolescence of that perspective, usually in a short time after the person says it. After graduating with a master's degree in economics, Greenspan got himself into the inner circle of an up-and-coming author in exile from the Soviet Union. Greenspan fue amigo personal y en cierto sentido se puede decir hasta discípulo de una figura que es precisamente el ejemplo, uno de los ejemplos máximos de lo que es el pensamiento, la ideología neoliberal. Esa persona fue Ayn Rand. Si you separate the government from economics, if you do not regulate production and trade, you will have peaceful cooperation and harmony and justice among men. You are certainly an apple. These ultra-right-wing views were not very popular in a post-war United States where social programs were being financed by income taxes of 91% on the country's biggest earners. This laissez-faire economic system promoted by people like Rand and Greenspan was also criticized as being based on a very limited view of humans. Greenspan's view of human nature comes out of his celebration of the market that what we are as human beings are buyers and sellers. We sell whatever we have for the best price we can get, and we buy what we need and want in life uh, and try to pay the least possible for it. The notion that life is about relationships other than buying or selling is at best an afterthought Ayn Rand, in some ways, had his number. She described him as being something of a social climber and not as committed to objectivism, her philosophy, as some of the other acolytes. And she really, she kind of hit the nail on the head. Ayn Rand would provide Greenspan with the language that he would use for the rest of his life. But years later, he would break with her ideology by supporting massive government intervention in the economy, but only to help his colleagues on Wall Street. By this point, Greenspan was already installed in this Wall Street office building, where he amassed his first fortune. Once recognized as a successful banker and consultant, he made his move on political power in Washington, D.C. He was not a very dynamic person, as far as just his personality, his style. He was always kind of a retiring figure, but he was certainly very good at identifying people, whether it be Ayn Rand, very early in, the, you know, in, in, her, in her career, or later Nixon, early in his political career, Greenspan sort of could identify these as people with power, people who were big and dynamic in a way he wasn't, and he found ways to make himself useful in his quiet way. He first arrived in Washington as an economic advisor to Richard Nixon's presidential campaign. But it was under President Ford that he got an office in the White House as the president's chief economic advisor just down the hall from his schoolmate at George Washington High, Henry Kissinger, who was now the Secretary of State. While Greenspan was promoting economic policies that would result in one of the largest transfers of wealth to the rich in history, Kissinger was playing decisive roles in the coup d'etat in Chile, the dirty war in Argentina, the genocide in East Timor, 
the Pakistani occupation of Bangladesh, and other crimes against humanity. In Greenspan's case, it was clear that he wanted to be more than just an advisor, and it seems that even his romantic life may have become a means to that end. Greenspan was in the habit of dating um, members of the media, because bear in mind, these are the people that are, that are interviewing them, reflecting glory back on them, possibly heaping criticism on them. And so in Greenspan's case, when he first arrived in Washington, he dated Barbara Walters. Later he dated and then married Andrea Mitchell. Dr. Greenspan is uh, special to us here at the Press Club because he's the husband of Andrea Mitchell, who the National Press Club just honored a couple weeks ago with our fourth estate award for lifetime achievement in journalism. So we were honored. And so I always kind of took it that these, this, that's the perfect power couple, a Washington power figure such as Greenspan, someone involved in the government, and a member of the media. When Gerald Ford lost his reelection bid to Jimmy Carter, Greenspan went back to New York to work as a consultant to the world's most powerful bankers. He even got a seat on the board of directors at J.P. Morgan, one of the largest banks in the country. In a 1977 interview with the New York Times about his return to the private sector, he said, to be honest, my role hasn't really changed. It, it's sort of laughable, huge proportion of the leading financial regulators in Washington come from the leading banks that they ostensibly regulate. And so it's a very cozy relationship. And that was a moment of honesty by Mr. Greenspan. To say things haven't changed much is literally true. His golfing partner in Washington is the same person as his golfing partner in New York. In 1987, with Ronald Reagan in the presidency leading a program of tax reduction and market liberalization, the moment arrived. Reagan appointed Greenspan as chairman of the Federal Reserve, one of the most powerful positions in the world. The kid who used to look for coins on the beach was now in charge of printing the currency. <coughs> Journalist William Grider has followed Alan Greenspan and the Federal Reserve for decades. I interviewed him once when he was chairman of the Fed, and I never <laughs> attempted to do it again, because you can tell whether somebody's going to talk to you for real or just give you the propaganda. You can tell pretty clearly you're wasting your time with this guy. He's not going to. Greenspan hadn't been in the top job at the Fed more than a few weeks when he tried to use his power to help a friend, Charles Keating, who had already broken numerous laws in an effort to get his bank out of bankruptcy. Greenspan proposed to do a special lending for him. And it was a clear case of him favoring Keating, whom he had worked for as a consultant just before entering service as the Federal Reserve Chairman. Now, other people at the Fed said, oh my God, you realize if we do that, we will be in the scandal? <laughs> and, they, and they got him to back off. And it's a classic case of where the media didn't have the guts to really go after him. They can't not have known about this because I and some other people wrote about it. And a lot of people inside the Federal Reserve System who were appalled by what Greenspan was tr attempting shared the, the inside paper with people like me and other reporters. Anyway, he got off the hook. Keating went to prison. Any action by the government that prevents some of the negative consequences to the private sector of the mistakes it makes raises the threshold of risks market tar participants will presumably subsequently choose to take. In suggesting printing millions of dollars and handing them over to a former client, Greenspan showed that he was willing to abandon his ideology when it was in his interest to do so. The interesting question is, he, is he sincerely naive or is it, is it a ruse? I mean, it may be sincere and also a ruse. Right? I mean, that he, these, are, these are values that he, just, he does believe in and wants to believe in, but he doesn't behave that way. I did not take the oath I've just taken with the intention of presiding over the dissolution of the world's strongest economy. During Reagan's presidency, 
the policies of the Federal Reserve had a huge impact outside the United States. Si cualquier gobierno de Latinoamérica quiere tomar prestado en dólares, pues la cantidad de dólares y el rendimiento va a estar directamente atado a esa tasa de interés eh, decidida por la Reserva Federal. La crisis de los 80, la crisis de la deuda, la década perdida en América Latina, en términos de estas deudas nacionales eh, exorbitantes, también puede ser conectada a precisamente el intento de la Reserva Federal de controlar la inflación, eh, subiendo las tasas de interés. In the US, the economic era in which Greenspan headed up the Fed has received many names. But one clear trend that continues up to the current day is what is called the financialization of the economy. La financialización es el rol de cómo las ganancias corporativas que se hacen a través de operaciones financieras ocupan un lugar más prominente en la riqueza creada o riqueza distribuida de las economías eh, capitalistas. Anteriormente, por ejemplo, las ganancias mayormente se hacían al vender eh, bienes y servicios. Mientras que ahora parece que esas ganancias se hacen a base de prestar dinero, a base de cobrar una tasa de interés por prestar ese dinero. Históricamente hay muchos casos de corporaciones que han cambiado de, ser, eh, de estar enfocadas en la producción de bienes y servicios a ofrecer eh, servicios financieros. Yo creo que el ejemplo más claro de eso es la General Motors. Y hubo un momento en que la General Motors reconoció de que podía expandir sus servicios en términos de proveer y prestar dinero a las personas que querían comprar sus automóviles. Y fueron tan exitosos y fue tan rentable esa actividad financiera que decidieron, bueno, vamos a prestarle dinero a cualquier persona. Eso fue lo que se llamó el General Motors Acceptance Company. Eh, y llegó un momento en que General Motors hacía mucho más dinero prestando dinero que vendiendo automóviles. To see the effect of financialization up close, we go back to the neighborhood of Greenspan's birth. As a poor child in Washington Heights, one of the only pleasures that Greenspan's family could afford was to watch films at the Audubon Theater. Today, the Audubon doesn't show films anymore because it's now a bank. No me sorprende para nada que esto se haya dado, aunque creo que es muy <laughs> sintomático <laughs> que esto haya pasado. Yo no lo sabía. Eh, wow. The Audubon didn't become just any bank, but J.P. Morgan Chase, where Greenspan once sat on the board of directors. Today, it's the largest bank in the United States. The rise of J.P. Morgan Chase is due in large part to the massive bank deregulation carried out under Greenspan's tenure in Washington. That process made it so that banks make significantly greater profits gambling on Wall Street than they do investing in real-life activities like going to the movies. The most significant steps in this deregulation took place under President Clinton, including a law allowing the unregulated sale of a controversial financial instrument known as derivatives. That law even prohibits government regulators from monitoring the trading of derivatives, which is now in the trillions of dollars. Only one person inside the executive branch dared to challenge the will of Greenspan, Clinton, and Wall Street. Her name is Brooksley Bourne, chairperson of the CFTC, the federal institution charged with regulating derivatives. This lack of basic information about the positions held by OTC derivatives users may threaten our regulated markets or indeed our economy without any federal regulator knowing about it. In response, Greenspan appealed to our faith in the wisdom of the free market that they're clearly are perceived as a significant value in diversifying and in bundling risk, because if that weren't the case, they wouldn't be growing as rapidly as they had. Let's uh, not presume that the ideal outcome is more regulation, I think. The Brooksy Bourne thing was just brutal. They broke her arms. I mean, I mean, that figuratively, but it was really, I mean, it was very out front. When Bourne continued insisting on regulating derivatives, President Clinton stripped her of her regulatory authority. Greenspan's dream of a financial system with no rules was pretty much in place. And after finishing his fifth term as Fed Chair, he retired. President Bush awarded him the Medal of Freedom, the US's highest civilian honor. The United States honors Alan Greenspan for his outstanding career of public service and for enhancing the character and prosperity of our nation.
Then, Greenspan wrote a best-selling memoir, in which he praised himself for helping create such a stable and prosperous economy. I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs> well, well let, Mr. Mr. Chairman, if I may, just one more. Please. Of course, and this has happened so often in history, he reaches the peak of his enthusiasm literally on the eve of the complete breakdown of everything he said wouldn't and couldn't break down. Right now, breaking news here, stocks all around the world are tanking because of the crisis on Wall Street. The market fell uh, as if down a well. September 15th, 2008, less than one year after the publication of his self-congratulatory autobiography, global financial markets collapsed and the unregulated derivatives were at the center of the resulting crisis. And my question for you is simple. Were you wrong? It would be sure the mic is turned on. During his long rise to the chairmanship of the Federal Reserve, Alan Greenspan showed a willingness to obey authority. But once he was in a position of power, he made a handful of remarks stating that which was obvious to many, but that few in his position would dare to confirm. Such as in 2007 when he wrote, I am saddened that it is politically inconvenient to acknowledge what everyone knows. The Iraq war is largely about oil. But it was one month after the start of the 2008 financial meltdown, during his testimony in front of Congress, that Greenspan unleashed the most shocking confession of his well, life. Remember that what an ideology is, is a conceptual framework with the way people deal with reality. Everyone has one. You have to, you, to exist, you need an ideology. The question is whether it is accurate or not. And what I'm saying to you is yes, I found a flaw. You found a flaw in a the flaw, reality? A flaw in the model that I perceived is the critical functioning structure that defines how the world works, so to speak. In other words, you found that your, your view of the world, your ideology, was not right. It was that, not that, working. That is, it had a, that precisely. No, I, that's precisely the reason I was shocked, because I had been... Así que eso para Greenspan fue un momento de aporia. Aporia es un término griego. Básicamente significa que es un choque que uno tiene con la realidad, que tal vez los mercados de por sí no son una institución necesariamente eficiente que garantice el bienestar para las masas. One level is a very human admission of error, but another level, I think this is what people cued into, Greenspan was never the most empathetic person. He was an economic technocrat, someone who, you know, was sifting through the data. I found a flaw. I don't know how significant or permanent it is, but I've been very distressed by that fact. Of course, being wrong also had very human, drastic consequences. You know, people, people losing their jobs, lives devastated by a poor economy. And that was not, not a place where he was exactly positioned to sound the right notes. People said, well, aren't you excited by this? He's finally admitted he's wrong. And I said, no, he hasn't. He just, he just, they're just words. I have a, a fairly low opinion of professional economies. I've read a million ways they put things to seem to be acknowledging something, but they don't actually change their views about anything. For the first time in decades, Alan Greenspan disappeared from the public eye. And when he reappeared, he reassured everyone that the so-called flaw wasn't actually that serious after all. Isn't it, isn't it more than a flaw? Isn't it a, an indictment of Ayn Rand and the view that laissez-faire capitalism can be expected uh, to, to function properly, that, that markets can be trusted to police themselves? Not at all. I think that there is no alternative. What is chastening to me is how little the, the act of saying those things in public, how little that has any impact on the government or the politics. A new scientific study from Princeton University concludes that the U.S. government functions more like a plutocracy than a democracy. The authors conclude, while Americans do enjoy many features central to democratic governance, such as regular elections, freedom of speech and association, and a widespread, if still contested, franchise, 
Our analysis suggests that majorities of the American public actually have little influence over the policies our government adopts. More and more Americans are critical of capitalism, are bitter about an economy that let them down, even more bitter about the so-called recovery, which seems only to have helped the 5% at the top. Already in 2014, many of the largest corporations in the country, such as McDonald's and Walmart, have seen the most significant internal revolts in their history, in which thousands of employees are demanding a living wage. And while Greenspan's autobiography was the best-selling economics book of the year leading up to the 2008 collapse, the bestseller so far in 2014 is Capital in the 21st Century, an investigation into the roots of the global rise in inequality. In the U.S. culture, no single individual has replaced Greenspan as the maximum authority on economic questions. It's possible that Greenspan's legacy will be that those who attempt to do so will be forced to include in their ideology that infamous flaw.